I have uh, waited a long time and thought about what would be the first thing I would say to you all. And it is this. God help you if you say revival is coming. Because it's here. Somebody shout. Well, you may be seated. Thank God that your hunger for God was greater than this rain. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the name of the state, but the letter uh, begins with the letter California. where they would have melted in this kind of weather. Although, let me tell you something, there is a massive move of God in California. There is. And let's thank God for it. In a moment, I'm going to do something extremely rare. I'm going to preach Bible verses in context and present an unapologetic, soul-winning sermon. Yeah. In order to do that, I want you to know that everyone that's moving around is not bothering me, because when it's for this reason, we have to be very, very compassionate and patient. It is important that all of you that are here, and by the way, how many of you love Gary Chapman and friends today? Let them know right now. Let them know. Amazing. It is very important for you to know that no man can explain the phenomenon on these grounds. It is not because of me. I cannot heal you. But Christ, who is present with us, is going to be healing people everywhere, of everything. And it will all be to the glory of Christ. When you preach the gospel, you rely on the Holy Spirit to convict the heart. And in a moment, after, I'm going to begin this sermon, but I want to tell you that in a moment, I'm going to call you out of your seat. From over here, from over here, all the way in the back. And from this area. And I'm going to ask you to give your life to Christ. I'm going to ask you to lay down your doubt and your fear and experience the power of God in a personal and real level. And I want you to know that once I begin, I am completely surrendered to the Holy Spirit. I'm no longer a man attempting to preach. I'm an emptied vessel so that I might be full of the Holy Spirit. My Father, raise your hands. My Father and my God, I come to you now and I ask you to remove all the resistance to the truth. All of the resistance to the Word of God. And allow, Lord Jesus, a mighty display of your conviction. Lord, what I mean by conviction is that hearts will want you more than they've ever wanted you in their life. 
that they will be willing to surrender and say yes to everything that is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. I'm going to say it again. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Ladies and gentlemen, when that phrase was first written down, it was by a man at his wit's end who had lost everything that ever meant anything to him. His loss, his vacuum, his emptiness, his pain was so complete that it is impossible to put into English language how he felt. He was convinced that God was through with him, that he had crossed the line. When he said, creating me a clean heart, he was desperate, thinking God would never hear him. David had sent for Bathsheba, and he had sinned. Then he arranged for her husband to be murdered. This man that wrote the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, had become the enemy of God. He'd become every vile thing that he thought he had the moral high ground over his predecessor, King Saul. He said to himself, I'm not like Saul. I'm not killing the priests. But in one moment, evil and the undertow of evil had taken him over. Creating me a clean heart. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. I'm going to talk to you about having a clean heart. I'm going to tell you that the most disastrous thing that has happened to America is that we don't understand our pain. We don't know why the problems of our children, the spirit of suicide, perversion, Loneliness and isolation are so great in America. You see, we have the desire to have a clean heart. It's in you, whether you believe it or not. No matter all the layers you try to put over it, there is something in you that says, I wish I was forgiven of all my sin. I wish that I had a clean heart. So David said these words. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, filled with clean thoughts and right desires. Don't toss me aside, banish forever from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. David had so lied to himself that a prophet could give him a parable. A parable where he is the villain in the story. And not even know it. There was a man who had a thousand sheep. And he had a neighbor that only had one. And that sheep of that one man in that his neighbor was like a pet. Raised it as a member of the family. And that man with a thousand sheep went over and stole the lamb killed the lamb, and Nathan said to David, what do you think should be done now? He said, whoever that man is should be brutally punished. And the man of God looked at David and said, you are the man. Now I'm going to talk to you about the fact that the four most prosperous states in America also have the highest suicide rate. The woke culture is not working. 
It is not working. It is a brutal failure. And I want you to understand that it became fashionable in America to bash sermons against sin. Oh, and you look intellectual when you do that. You look fashionable when you bash a preacher who gets that old book out and preaches the old verse that teaches that sin has torment. But you know what? You in your life have proven the Bible to be right because the Bible said America would be miserable, any nation would be miserable. Any nation that rejected God would be miserable. And how is it that we laugh that we've rejected God and like David can't see ourselves in the mirror, in the parable that's about us? America is an example of a nation blessed with so much and has turned her back on all of it. And you know what it did? It put blood in the streets. It put violence in our cities. It made our children to be the most victimized group of children America's ever seen. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. You want a clean heart. You just don't know it. You don't realize how deep it goes. Borrowing from the story of David in the movie Godfather 3, there is a moment when Michael Corleone is portrayed as having visited the Pope. And the Pope said to him, let's go over here in his garden. This is where my priests confess to me and make their confession. And then he sat there and he said, but if I'm not willing to repent, what is the point of me confessing? And the, and the character who played the Pope said these words, the need to confess can be overwhelming. And when it's there, you must seize the moment. I'm a man of God. And I'm telling you, some of you have left your wife. Some of you have killed your own children. Some of you have done things. And the woke culture has given you layers and layers of protection. And you think that that's good. That you don't feel bad. That you're antidepressant that your lifestyle, that your excuses, that the songs you sing, the things you text, and your TikTok videos will assuage and salve your conscience. But you are paying the price. You pay it in the last moment before you go to bed. You pay it in the first moment when you wake up. Life has no meaning, no flavor. Relationships are empty. And there is a despair. Never have Americans been so afraid of the future. So the Pope says to Michael Corleone, the need to confess can be overwhelming. The need for a clean heart. I asked the, the Gary Chapman and the friends to sing that old hymn about the blood of Christ, about a fountain filled with blood. And I'm going to talk to you right now about the church of Oprah, about the new age, about the dream catchers, about everything. Let me tell you something. They can put all kinds of remedies and layers and band-aids and numb you. But you will never have peace. Never. Never will you lay your body down to sleep with peace until you surrender to Christ. Until you surrender to Christ, there can be no peace. I want to tell you that a, a couple of years ago, the atheist of the city of London put a bunch of money together and bought all of the signage on the side of the double-decker buses. And you know what it said? It said, there probably is no God. Go ahead and enjoy your life. And you would think that as a preacher, the part that would make me mad is the part that says there probably is no God. That didn't do it for me. What set me off is where it says, go ahead and enjoy your life. You know, the people who are real heroes of mine are Frank Saldana and Inner City Action, 
who are the teams that are working all over this tent, right? Clap for them real loud. Clap for them. Thank you, Frank. I can name so many. Morgan up here, Cassandra, Monique, all of you. They're like family to me. But you know what they see in their work? A young girl, maybe 14 years old, will wander into their center. She's a prostitute, high on drugs, because her pimps keep putting a needle in her arm so she can do her work. Day after day after day, we've watched that Frank has brought them in and they've gotten saved and they've been spared from hell only to be kidnapped again by those primps and immediately they are forced, tied down and they put a needle in their arm again. Now tell that 14 year old girl, Mr. Atheist, to go on and enjoy her life. Tell the single mother who lives across from a crack house or in the killing fields of Chicago or the misery of New York City. Tell them, go ahead and enjoy your life. This is the lie of the modern culture and you need to quit watching their films and listening to their lie. And you need to understand. You know, in the quietness of your own time, your thoughts of regret, your thoughts of disappointment, they will work on you. And you will realize that the foundation of your life is something that you keep yourself busy. You keep yourself stimulated because at the moment when the wheels of your life stop, that spark of needing to confess and needing to kneel before God and to say, I'm so sorry. I've ruined everything. I've wrecked everything. I've been so wrong. And I want to get right. I'm not done yet. That billboard on the side of the bus says, there's probably no God. Go ahead and enjoy your life. Nobody's enjoying their life. Except those that have Christ as Lord of their life. You know what? I've got to say this. I've got to say it to the bully professor. I've got to say it to the atheist. I've got to say it to Oprah directly. Quit, quit telling me that I messed myself up by giving my life to Christ. Quit telling me that I checked my brain at the door. Quit telling me that I gave up my individuality and my power of choice. When I gave my life to Christ, Everything beautiful began to happen to me. And everything vile went away. Somebody clap for Christ. Somebody tell the world what the Lord means to you. What it meant to you to meet Him. The deepest pain of your life is because you have unconfessed sin. The deepest agony of your life is because there's something you want to tell God. And now... I'm going to say something very controversial. And I hope you will think before you react. It was bad enough that woke culture said you don't need to repent. It was bad enough that our current administration is exalting sin. It's bad enough that our schools taught perversion to our children. I understand why they said you don't need to repent, but my God, why did the pastors start doing it?
Not all of them. Not all of them. There are many great men and women of God under this tent and all over this state. But you know exactly who I'm talking about. One of them got on TV and said, the Lord has not led me to preach against sin. And he will stand before God for speaking that lie. For Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. There's never been a release of the kingdom of God without repentance, without confession of sin. Then we have another minister that said, God is offended when you confess your sin. He even said that the verse in 1 John 9 that says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. He said that verse was written in non to uh, non-Christians. It wasn't written to Christians. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, when it begins with that it was addressed to a house church. It is amazing how naive Christians are today. As soon as someone gets a Facebook page, as soon as someone gives a prophetic word, people are buying into it. Let's get back in the word of God. Somebody help me now. And let's stop. Let's stop having out of Bible experiences. You know what happened to you, man of God? You know what happened to you, woman of God? Someone came and said, you know, I've got a big church. I've got a giant church. I need a golf cart to get across my church. And you could have a church just like me if you come to my seminar. And here's a young pastor, a young couple, beating their brains out to grow a church. And suddenly they give them a, a binder and a syllabus and they flatter them and they get them aside. And suddenly their pulpit is poison. Suddenly there's no preaching on repentance anymore. Suddenly there's this, this moment where all of a sudden they say to themselves, you know what? I may not be telling the truth, but at least my church is growing. And here's the worst lie of all. The worst lie is how unnecessary it is to compromise. If you see this audience here, look at the size of this audience. Were they tricked here, seduced here? Did we use big screen skinny jeans and fog machines to get them in here? Did we lie to them? Did we promise them something stupid? No. Because people are hungry to get right with God. Millions of Christians go to a church. They say they're 90 million evangelicals. If only 1% of them were on fire, you think we'd have the mess in Washington, D.C. that we have right now? It's that they can live with abortion. It's that they can live with immorality. It's that they can live with a compromise that says this, better for us to appear loving to the outside world than to bring up the issue. You see what's on my face right now? Look at these are lights. David Wilkerson preached a powerful sermon on that we are the light of the world. We are lights. But you know what? If you shine a light into some basements, you're going to see roaches running everywhere. So this idea that shining the light is always a smiling, peaceful, loving experience, it's not true. We need to shine a light on the lies that are being told to our children. We're not being a light. When you tell someone that something is a sin, you're shining a light if you do it in love. You know, I was at NBC News said to me, what is your position on homosexuality? What is your opinion? I said, I, my opinion doesn't matter, but I can tell you what the word of God said. Let, help me somebody, we're supposed to be a light. I'm gonna try to get, we're supposed to be a light. If you get in a pulpit and you keep the rightful biblical demands off of the audience, 
then you have an inordinate codependent relationship with that audience. Because what is happening is they are rewarding you and paying you to keep the demands of God off of them. The true pastor says, you know what? You may not like what I'm saying, but I love you. And I love you too much to let you live in darkness. I love you too much to be obsessed with that. Now, let me explain something. I was preaching in Fresno, California. We were doing a rally in advance, kind of like what we did here with the brunch. And the church was packed out. Our crowds are growing all over America. And believe me, it's a moment of soberness for me. But I got up in that pulpit, and there were many men of God, many women of God in the ministry there. And again, I'm telling you, pastors are my best friends. These warriors that grow a church the right way and preach the truth, I have to tell them, look, get rid of the idea that in order to have a big church, you have to lie and, and be corrupt. Because the Word of God, let me tell you, wherever two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them. And wherever Jesus is, the crowds are going to grow. So I looked at these men. I looked at these men and I said to them, I'm going to do a test right now. I said, if you're in this audience, I want you to raise your hand. If you have had your social media get you in trouble with your boss because you said something Christian and hands went up. How many of you have a child that was expelled from school because they wore a Christian t-shirt to a public school? How many of you had that? Raise your hand. Hands went up. I said, how many of you have been fired from your job because you witnessed to someone on the company property? Hands went up. And then I looked at the preachers and I said, how many of you are preaching sermons to what your people are actually going through? Not what you think they're going through. Well, you know they can. not Because he said, if I start to mention abortion, I'm going to lose people. If I start to mention critical race theory and why it's racist, I'm going to get in trouble. If I bring politics, the pastor told me to my face one time, if I bring politics into the pulpit, it's wrong. So I looked at him and I said, let me ask you the real reason you're not preaching on any of those things. He said, I would lose members. I said, you would mean you would lose votes. I said, you're the politician. Now, everybody look this way. Because here it comes. Churches need to preach what will get rid of the need to confess. Give people a chance to get right with God. Listen to me. Don't protect them from that moment at the altar where they finally say, it's your way, not my way. And I repent of everything I've done. And I'm going to turn to the ways of Jesus. I'm going to give you one more verse. It's the most convicting verse I've read in a long time. The modern preachers who have taken the blood out of the pulpit, the cross out of the pulpit, the existence of hell out of the pulpit, the second coming of Christ, the inerrancy of Scripture out of the pulpit are guilty of Jeremiah 6, verse 14. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. And I'm going to submit to you that American wokeness has falsely comforted you. It is bring nothing that will give you peace in your heart. The attraction churches that have compromised the Word of God will never give you peace. They will not give you peace. They'll give the idea that Daddy God is just into you so much that He loves you exactly the way you are without finishing the truth that He loves you too much to let you stay that way. Now,
What I'm about to say is also controversial, and it'll get me off of YouTube, which uh, almost bothered me for a moment. I'm telling you that whether you were afflicted by a compromised modern church or afflicted by your professor in college, I'm putting them all together in one group. And I'm telling you that the message of this hour is that you have a passion deep inside of you to be clean before God. And that pain that you have masked with layers and layers, a layer of it came from a professor. A layer of it came from social media. But God forgive us that another layer of it came from church. So what's happened is you don't have peace. You don't have direction. You don't have any real life. And here's where it comes to. It's a vaccine that doesn't work. You look good when you believe in that vaccine. You feel good, but it will not destroy the disease that it was designed to destroy. You know what? We used to go to church to become good. Now we go to church to feel good. And feeling good is another narcotic that delays that moment of where you weep tears of joy. Because as David said, created me a clean heart, oh God, and restored to me the joy of my salvation. Let me tell you, I sound like I'm being overbearing, but I'm not. Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there would be many gospels. A vaccine that doesn't work, that makes it worse and more susceptible to the disease that you are trying to be cured of. And everybody tells you, you need it. It's called modern wokeism, compromised Christianity. And you know what it does? If you walk into a church where the Bible is insulted, where the Holy Spirit is gagged, where truth is duct taped, you're going to come out of there worse than you went in. Because you are getting an immunity that you do not want. Now I'm going to stop with that. How many of you still love me even though I said all that? There are two things that fuel the inner pain of your heart. Your spirit knows something that your mind does not. Your spirit is gripped because God put a spark inside of you. And what you're gripped by, if you listen very carefully, is you are gripped by two realities. One, when you die, you will stand before God to be judged. Oh, I don't like that idea. But the Bible says it is once appointed unto man to die and then the judgment. And you will stand before God. We feel it in our literature. It comes out in our theatrics, in our movies. There's this feeling that we're going to pay a price. You hear it every once in a while. It comes out. You know, there's a reckoning. There's a we're going to have to pay the price. And I'm not talking about global warming. Something way warmer. They tell me that a large percentage of Christians do not believe in hell. But if you don't believe in hell, you're probably not born again. And that's a fact you need to consider. Because if you say, I'm saved, from what? Now, let me ask you another question. And I'm not trying to be cute or even intellectual. 
But the Bible tells us something that Jesus said. Do not fear those who can kill the body. Fear him who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. Matthew 10, verse 28. But Mario, I find the idea of an eternal hell highly repulsive. And therefore, it doesn't exist. And you actually said that in your heart. You've said that. But here's the problem. You are making God in your image. You are, you are imputing to God characteristics about yourself. And violating the first of all the Ten Commandments. You will not make a graven image of God. Just because you can't imagine how a loving God could create hell doesn't mean that a loving God cannot create hell, especially when his son, who you quote so often, says there is a hell. Because we find it impossible to absorb, impossible to accept. We have got to understand the reality that we do not have the right to cherry pick the parts of Christ's words that we like and leave out the ones that we do not. You want to be clean. I'm going to finish with one last story. Several years ago, back in the year 19, none of your business. <laughs> I was invited to an event in Marin County called the Holy Man Jam. And what it was is every major religion of the world was given five minutes to defend their reality. And they sandwiched me between transcendental meditation and Scientology. They gave me a good slot. The problem was that I didn't know that I would only have five minutes. And I didn't know what the purpose of the event was. So I came utterly unprepared. And the Bible says, do not prepare beforehand what you will speak, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to gainsay nor resist. The fact was, I was never more obedient to a verse in my life than that one. Soon it became apparent that this Holy Man Jam was a contest between religious spiritual disciplines and what they could offer you. You'll be a better romantic. You get a better girlfriend, a higher salary. Your athletic prowess will go fast. You'll be faster, smarter, greater. So I'm pouring through the New Testament trying to get Christianity to compete with all that. And I kept coming up with except you deny yourself that you got to give up everything. I said, Lord, that's not going to work in this venue right here. <laughs> so there it was. It was my turn, and I got up. I looked. They were all behind me, and I looked at the audience. How many of you would like to know what I said? Raise your hand if you... I think I'm taking too long. So I looked at them and I said, today I have heard every conceivable perk, talent, and accoutrement that could ever be offered a crowd. You're going to be muscular. You're going to be irresistible. People of the opposite sex are going to find you a magnet and your IQ will go up. And today... I don't promise you any of those things. These people are trying to make you feel calm. I'm here to make you nervous. Now, the one talent that all of them wish they had, more than money, 
more than romance, more than intelligence. The one thing that they wish they had can only be found in Christianity. And Paul said it because you know what? This is a gigantic how-to event. How to run faster. How to be more attractive. How to be smarter. But the how-to that you want is only found in one place. And Paul said it in the book of Thessalonians. He said, when we came to you, brethren, we taught you how to please God. And I looked at the crowd and I said, sure enough, you're smart. But I can make God smile. I'm going to try it again. I can make God smile. There is no emotion, no drug, no pleasure that this world will ever provide you. That is as great as having God speak to you and say, in you, I am well pleased. How many of you want to please God? Close your eyes, everyone. I'm especially talking to our valiant heroes under the umbrellas outside the tent. Some of them are wondering why the animals are marching two by two over there <laughs> on the opposite side of the field. The song Amazing Grace has been perverted by modern theology because amazing grace says it was grace that taught my heart to fear. And we've been preaching forever that grace will never make you afraid. But it will. And out of mercy, it'll do it. It's out of mercy that God allows you to know that you need to be forgiven. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me, O God, a clean heart. A heart that loves you. And you know what I want most of all, Lord? Every sin I have ever committed to be washed away by the most powerful cleansing agent the world has ever known. Everybody put your hand over your heart. I don't want anyone to miss what I'm going to say in this next moment. You have been fooled in a false church by a false gospel. You've been told you were saved, but the word of God is very clear. If you have added God to your plan, you are not a Christian. If you have renounced the inerrancy of scripture, you are not a Christian. If you cannot point to a moment in your life where you literally signed over your rights to Christ, you are not a Christian. You say, Mara, that's, that's pretty harsh. It's harsh now. But when you stand before God on that day and suddenly look up and realize that it was a counterfeit, artificial faith that you had hoped would get you into heaven, that's when the horror will begin. If the horror begins now, it's mercy. When David felt the weight of his sin, it was mercy. When that moment to confess and to say, I want a clean heart, hits you. It's mercy. Recently, someone mentioned Charles Finney. And they said that maybe we're seeing something in this area like when he was here. But did you know that that man could walk into a factory and all the workers would begin to weep? When he preached, he would wait and he would open up the seats in the front for those who were convicted of sin to mourn. They call mourner's bench. And it became a part of the power of his preaching was this wailing and crying that was going on at the front. And when I heard that wonderful comparison that was very flattering and scary, I thought, well, why did people react to sin preaching with such force then and not now? 
And that's a testimony to our culture. The layers and layers of insulation between the deepest part of your heart that wants to get right with God, that even betraying preachers have laid another layer of insulation. And that right now, the greatest thing in the world for you is if you're feeling your need for God. If you're feeling the passion that I don't want anything phony, I don't want anything fake, I want to know that I'm saved. For the sake of my children, I don't want to be a phony Christian. For the sake of my soul to stand before God, I want to be real. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for you. According to 2 Timothy chapter 2, in the final verse of that chapter, it says, pray for those who are outside, that they may come to their senses and be given the gift of repentance. Let me tell you the gift you don't want. The gift of explaining away everything that God is saying about your life right now. Your life hurts, God is saying to you right now, because you're not right with me. Your life hurts because you are holding the wheel and you are not letting me give you the blessings that I could if you would just receive my life and receive my power. The, the gift you don't want is the ability to say, preacher, nothing you said got into me. It just bounced off. The gift you want is the one that Paul said, coming to your senses and repenting. The gift of admitting you're wrong. And God is right. The gift of admitting you're wrong. And God is right. It's the end of your pain. It's the end. If you'll let it. Mario, I want to get right with God today. I want all my sins forgiven. And I'm going to publicly say that I am a child of God, washed in the blood. And I'm going to have that amazing moment. I'll, wherever you are, if that's you, put your hand in the air and do it now. All of you that have your hand raised, get up on your feet quickly. Get up on your feet quickly. And I'm going to warn you. I'm going to warn you. If God told you to stand up and you're not doing it, that's the proof of who's controlling you. If God told you to get up on your feet and you said no, you're a master, Satan has got the buttons and he's pushing them. And right now, we're all gonna set more people free by rebuking the devil. <laughs> Satan, I come against you right now. Satan, I come against you. And you will let every life go. Now for this, I need everyone to close your eyes. Mara, I know that I should have stood up with those brave and pe people. They're going to be happy tonight. I'm going to still be in my misery. So get up on your, out of your seat right now. Get up now. If you know you belong on your feet, get up now. If you brought someone and you feel them quaking under conviction, relieve them of their misery by saying, let's stand together. You know you want this. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. I want everyone on your feet to find the nearest aisle, wherever you are outside or inside this tent. And I'm going to address the audience that's watching me right now. You're not here with me, but God is there with you. And you can pray the same exact prayer that these people are about to pray. And you can receive life. All of you that are standing, make your way to the nearest aisle. Come to the front and come quickly. We're going to wait for you. Step.
closer toward me. Those of you in the front, those are tears of joy. You can see that the line goes all the way out of the tent, but we need you to come up. Let's sing that first verse again. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Everybody sing it. Workers, help them get to the sides. Workers, help them. going to sing the verse that goes when we've been there 10,000 years and I need you to sing it like you believe you're going to be there <laughs> 10,000 years bright shining as the sun We've no less days to sing His praise. Then when we first begun, now ladies and gentlemen, as they play that song softly, I would like all of you have come forward to remain standing right where you are. And audience, please be seated. And as soon as you're seated, you will get an image of the magnitude of what Christ has done in your region. And we give him the glory. Give him the praise. Give him the praise. Because the rain was falling, we wouldn't have been able to counsel you outside. But I want to know where Frank is. Do you know where Frank is? He's my weatherman. Is, is he here? I will find him in a moment. No problem. But I want all of you to look this way. And I want to move this aside. And I want you to look at me. The joy of the Lord is the most inexplicable emotion that God has ever granted the human heart. Paul said that the joy of the Lord was your strength. And you can know the Christians who are listening when the devil has stolen your joy. And you know, that, that has been said so many times that the weight of it has been stolen and lost as well. That's a terrible thing to be without joy. Think of it as the oil that keeps the parts of life from rubbing against each other. The friction. It's what holds you. Sometimes we'll read a terrible story about a Christian martyr and we'll walk away with a totally wrong conclusion. Instead of seeing a man that laughed in the face of death because the joy of the Lord was so strong. When they were pummeling the life out of Stephen with rocks, you know what he said? I see the Lord standing at the right hand of God. How many of you know that'll take the edge off of anything? But see, your life is like that. That's the kind of Christian I want you to be. I wrote a book called Vessels of Fire and Glory. And you know what? 
I was thinking that book is for mature Christians, but I think it's for you. Because we might, might as well mess you up from the beginning. <laughs> and make you a vessel of fire and glory. See, you don't want to tell God right now, oh, I just want to get right with you. you say, Lord, I want to live for you. I want to do exploits for you. I want to create things, invent things, write things, and do things. I, I want to be your, a constant blessing to you, God, and a constant nightmare to the devil. Put your hand over your heart. How many of you are ready to begin a life of power and joy? How is it outside? Still raining? Yeah, well... We would give you a fine wet coating, so we're going to keep you in here. But with your hand over your heart, say this with me. I see you on the cross, dying for me. A horrible death. You had so many ways to escape, but you went through with it because you loved me. Dying on the cross. Prove that you love me. Three days later, you came back from the dead. You conquered death. When you did that, you proved you had the power to make me a new person. I need that power that took you out of the grave to take me out of a terrible life and raise me to the one I was born to have. Jesus, you are my Lord now. Let your blood, let your blood wash away all my sin that I totally confess and put my name in the book of life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now. Now, I want all of you that are standing to listen to me. We have this new high-tech system of getting your information. It's awesome. We just developed it at great expense. And we are not going to use it. <laughs> because we, we would need to find room that we don't have. They could. All right. We're going to take you into the use of your smartphone. And we want you to take a picture of the code you see right up there and right there. Not yet, because I didn't give our technicians a chance to do it. I do that all the time. I say instantly, we're going to lift the tent off the ground. It's a QR code, code that will allow you. Are we doing it now? Yeah, it's coming. It's anticipation. Well, we're going to leave it up. And here's what we're going to do now. We're going to send you back to your seat, but we want you before you leave, all of you that are standing here, to, down, to uh, scan that code. And you'll see it's a very easy and wonderful way for us to record your conversion and to give you the help you need from this point on. Now, I want all of you that are here, turn around and face the audience. Those of you in the aisles, turn around. Now, <laughs> you, you beat me to the punch. Welcome your new family members, new brothers and sisters in Christ.
Now, I'm going to ask all of you to return to your seats. Audience, stay on your feet so they can get to their seats real easy and clap for them one more time. Welcome them into the family. Welcome them. While they're marching back, we're going to sing a song together that let them through. If anyone's a little bit slow, just go around them. Jesus right now. Shout! When you scan this code that you see on there, you'll see a very simple form you can fill out. We would like to get your information because there are some very powerful churches in this area and we want them all full, every one of them. The church is in Buffalo, the church is in Rochester and everything in between. How many of you know we're gonna believe God that there won't be an empty seat in any church? Shout. I'd like you to be seated.
How many of you believe that the power of the devil has been broken tonight in a very powerful way? Well, I'm going to uh, let the band accept the keyboard who's been doing so well. They've all been doing great, but I just want to release them to go back to their seat. And then I'm going to talk to you. Number one. Who knows when it'll ever be like this again in this area? I've heard the stories not only of the prophecies for this region, but also of how, much, how long you've been waiting. And some have gone to heaven without being able to see what you saw tonight. And they prophesied this. Who knows when this spirit of cooperation will be like this again? So if you have any ideas that the enemy would put in your mind that, oh, it's four nights, I can skip a night. I don't believe that. When the angels told the shepherds, go down to the manger, they went. When the wise men were told, they went. And they all did it for one reason. It was a once in a lifetime experience. Long after, let me tell you, what happens in a move of God? You get a big grin and bloodshot eyes. I told a man, because my wife and I just a year ago became grandparents, and wasn't that amazing? We have a little granddaughter, Lydia. I was relieved to learn that millennials could reproduce. I maybe know what I'm preaching right there. But I told someone revival is just like being a grandparent. When they bring those grandbabies over there, you are thrilled. And then you're glad when the parents come back. Because it was total joy and total exhaustion. I said, that's revival right there. You don't want to miss a night we're going to develop a way to do overflow within the church and all around. And on Sunday, this was an extraordinary, the greatest that we've ever seen in a tent crusade. We have never seen people show up 90 minutes early, fill the whole tent in the rain. This is revival right here. That's my number one announcement. I'm going to go through them fast. Next one. Put aside Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. I'm going to address politics and the pulpit. I'm going to kill some sacred cows because they make the most delicious hamburgers. They do. Especially pastors. You need to come and listen to what I have to say. At a, it's going to be 11 a.m. on Wednesday. 11 a.m. Wednesday under the tent. And I hear there's not going to be any rain Tuesday or Wednesday. Tomorrow might be a little bit, but we're staying in the tent. How could I spare the pleasure you enjoyed of getting wet on those who are coming tomorrow night? They need the right to be baptized as well. And tonight you got off easy. Because I don't believe in sprinkling. I believe in total immersion. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I wish every pastor that is here, because I've been in this a while. I've been preaching over 50 years. 
And a lot of people had never heard of me. And uh, they said, you're an overnight success. I said, yeah, a 50-year <laughs> overnight success. But we are going to do something that I want to share with you from our hearts. And I want to say this. We never beg for money. We teach on giving. And many times what the Lord will give me to say will turn around and be used by a pastor in the pulpit. And that is the highest compliment I could receive. Because I want every church to be out of debt with enough, according to the book of Corinthians, for every good work. Now, rather than to talk a lot about money, I want to talk about one thing. I don't believe in worrying about how the money will come in. I am fixated on how to get the word out. Not the money in, but the word out. So the Lord showed me that Ezra was given permission by the king to return to Israel and rebuild it. Both Ezra and Nehemiah were giving this, the, uh, this mandate from God, go back to Israel, build the wall, and make Israel great again. <laughs> Anybody here? Yeah. All of that is in the Bible. Now, when they decided to leave, People who could not go with them to the land of Israel for legitimate reasons gave them gifts. And the Bible says they gave them gifts to encourage them. Gifts of encouragement. I don't know of a greater thing than encouragement. But as I look at you, I want you to know what this tent meeting tonight has done. It is blasted open the East Coast for Mario Murillo Ministries. That's what it's done. To God be the glory. That's what it's done. We once did a crusade in downtown San Francisco that was attended by 14,000 people. That's the kind of work we do. And let me tell you, New York City is in the crosshairs. It is. It doesn't scare me one bit. I maybe want to believe God. So I want you to give a gift of encouragement to us. I believe that the Lord will take care of everything and I don't need to say a lot the gift you make out by check is made out to MMM we also have a way I don't know uh, we, we may not be able to put it on the screen and that's fine it's, but you can also give by taking one of our envelopes and use your credit card or if you're going to use cash we can give you a receipt for the amount that you've given because I don't want the current government to have one dime fight. Believe me. And I'm working on something. I'm working on getting out of the 501c3. I'm working on getting out. We're going to figure out a way to get out. Because we are going to shake off every shackle. But I want you to give, and I want you to know that your generosity is much appreciated. And so if you want one of our offering envelopes, please raise your hand. We'll give you one quickly. We'd like those of you that are going to give by check to go ahead, make it out simply to MMM. And thank you for being bold in your gift, being bold and encouraging us. In our first, this is our East Coast D-Day. We have put boots on the ground. We have landed. 
and we're not going to quit. Thank you so much. Now, how many of you can prepare to give and still listen to what I have to say? In the book of Romans, Paul said something. I have fully preached the gospel. I am a Pentecostal. You know, I didn't realize that until NBC News came to my house. And this very unfriendly lady with a microphone and a camera behind her, she said, what are you? Are you a Pentecostal or a charismatic? And I asked her, well, which one sounds more dangerous? And she said, P -p 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 Pentecostal. I said, that's what I am. Fire breathing, tongue talking, dancing in the Holy Ghost. Woo! Somebody help me. Anybody like me in here? I mean, not do you like me, but I mean, are you like me? Boy, would that have been narcissistic. So I want you to help us. I want you to know as well that I am thankful to Cornerstone Church, Pastor Paul Doyle, for giving us this sacred ground to use. What a wonderful gift. What a wonderful gift, brother. I don't believe that when this tent comes down that the move of God is going to lift. I believe that we are going to launch something but it's going to accelerate. The fire of God is going to fall on pastors in many churches. And you're going, to, you're going to see that your church is going to come alive. And I'm not saying it's not alive now. I'm just saying compared to what's coming, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. What a mighty God we serve. So if you would like to give by texting, could we put it up? Text uh, MMM. So far all I see is... Uh... All right. Text MMM to 91999 if you want to give that way. One thing we will never do is violate the purpose of the gift. I love uh, the commercials for the Hebrew national hot dogs. He said, we exceed government standards because we are accountable to a higher power. That's us too. God's commandment on handling money is much higher than the IRS's. And the IRS has got no business telling anyone how to handle money because they're like having the weasel guard the chicken coop. I have spoken. Does anyone need a moment more to complete your gift? All right, we're practically done. So I'm going to ask the workers to come to the front. Tomorrow night is a miracle service. Now there's a difference between a miracle service and a healing service. You say, Mara, now you're really parsing words. I'm going to explain the difference. The Bible talked about notable miracles. What we want tomorrow night is for the medical community to be rocked by the power of God. Do we? Valid divine healing biblically based Christ honoring so when should you come early but we'll talk about it as they I say this prayer Lord thank you for your encouragement tonight and we receive this gift as it is intended to win lost souls and to expand the vision of this ministry in the name of Jesus thank you and go ahead, workers. While you're doing that, I have one thing on my mind that I haven't gotten off my spirit yet. So while you're giving, everybody look me in the eye. 
One of the things that Christ has done in me, maybe this is why he waited so long for this promotion that we're enjoying now, is that I don't want the glory. I don't want the attention. I don't want the credit for anything. I, I live a very simple life. I don't need all this stuff. How many of you know, I am quite pleased. And when those of you that have seen us on Flashpoint and saw that, yeah. And I, you know what I think? I think Tuesday night, we ought to just be live and send something over to them from the tent. I think we ought to. Yeah, we'll do it. I'll talk to them. Because Gene said to me uh, last week, he said, can you send footage from the tent? How about if we go live from the tent? Yeah, that, yeah. All right. I think that'll be very much to the glory of God. But I want to tell you, in Sacramento, our brother from Minneapolis, who slipped and fell on rebar and it punctured his lung, came all that way to Sacramento and he sat in the center and the Holy Spirit revealed his illness and he stood up and instantly was healed. His, his left lung, which was 90% dead, is now fully functional. It's a miracle. But you need to know that there are hundreds of healings that we haven't even gotten a chance to talk about. We, we, we haven't even had an opportunity to get to them all because God's spirit has been so pervasive. But tomorrow night, when we have this miracle service, no man is going to be showcased. No person but Christ is going to be honored. And I'm telling you, the power of the Holy Spirit will descend. Not only in this tent, but people that are watching by live stream are going to be healed. Listen to me. She may be watching right now from uh, Lincoln, California. It's near Rockland and Sacramento. She had the most advanced condition of neuropathy in her hands and feet to where in order to watch TV, the pain in her fingers was so excruciating that she couldn't even type in to get online to see us on live stream. So she went to her church that happened to be live streaming it from their church. And she sat in the audience. And imagine if you're with about 50 people watching a preacher. And all of a sudden, he points into the camera and says, someone is watching online. <laughs> Where should I point? <laughs> online with severe neuropathy of your hands and feet. And she begins to cry out loud as the pain left her feet and her hand in front of these people. Miracles. Somebody say miracles. Say miracles. So she takes it upon herself to go to her doctor to see if something else had happened. That something else was stage four liver cancer. And she goes to the doctor and says, my hands and feet were healed. I need to know about my liver. And the doctor did that doctor look. Took the necessary x-rays. And when they came back, he said, you have no cancer anywhere in your body. Who knows what God is going to do tomorrow night under this tent?